You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the CEO and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models and analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. Thank you for joining us for this episode today. We will discuss one of the fastest growing sports globally over the last 30 years, its rise and the capitalization of its success. Joining us is Michael Thompson to talk about his recently published book, Cage Kings, how an unlikely group of moguls, champions, and hustlers transformed the UFC into a $10 billion industry. To give our, our listeners a little bit background on Michael, uh, he writes about sports, video games, technology, and political culture for The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Vanity Fair, Forbes, Wired, The New Republic, and other publications. And let's see, just so I don't butcher this, um, Michael, you're a UCLA grad as well. Yeah, that's correct. Class of 99. Nice, nice. Well, it's Westwood's a beautiful campus. Um, I've I've driven through it on my way through business meetings before, and um, I, I I put it on the list of places I would allow my daughters to go, um, which I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing. Um, so let's open up with you know what inspired you to write this book. You kind of tell a little bit about your story early on uh, before the uh, before you get started with the first chapter. Um, teach our tribe what inspired you to write this. Um. Well, it was kind of a slow growing process. I had been into the UFC um, since it started off and on, um, but I had never been in the MMA beat. So it was just sort of like a personal interest that had kind of come in and out of my life at different times based on how accessible it was. You know, it kind of went dark for a period in the 90s and then it kind of reemerged in the reality TV boom in the mid 2000s. And, you know, I think in 2014, 2015, I became more interested in writing about fighting and kind of how it fit into our culture. And I wanted to do an anthology looking back at different prize fights over the last four or 500 years, sure. <laughs> doing a chapter on each fight from like, you know, samurai showdowns to like catch wrestling in the 1800s to like bare knuckle boxing, um, college wrestling matches, UFC fights, pride fights in Japan. Um, based on just sort of this, the narrative and what people thought was at stake in a, different kinds of prize fights at different points in time um, and in different cultures around the world. So, I, you know, I worked on that for about six, seven months, and that was obviously like a huge project and sure. kind of a boring project, a, a big <laughs> idea, but like in practice, nobody wants to read an anthology. It's sort of like reading a listicle or something like that, you know? Sure. Um, so my agent and my wonderful editor at Simon and Schuster kind of helped me pare it down and they kind of encouraged me to, uh, just tell the history of one fighting company and instead of trying to, you know, tell the story of every culture and every period in history, why not just focus on one point in history and one company. And so the UFC was the most recent. It was the most obvious. It was the one that I had the biggest personal connection to as a fan. And um, kind of, as I mentioned in the book, it was also, I was the target demographic for the UFC through its entire history. I've been in that male 18 to 34, now 18 to 40, 49 demographic, you know, my whole life. You know, I was a junior in high school when the first UFC came out. And, you know, I was in my late 20s, early 30s when The Ultimate Fighter, the reality series that kind of repopularized the UFC came out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they've been trying to reach me and people like me for the entire lifespan of the company and for, you know, my entire adult life. So I thought that was an interesting sort of story, too, that I could kind of compare my own life and the trajectory of my own like financial circumstances and personal views, you know, and see how like culture had imprinted itself on me 
in particular and kind of use that as a lens to try and understand the company and, and its, its business plan. Yeah, after listening to your story, I tried to think back to when I first really became familiar with UFC. And it was February of 07. I was living in Phoenix at the time, and I drove across to see my brother in Albuquerque. And it was, there, was a, there was a UFC fight on that Saturday night. We ended up at like the Buffalo Wild Wings in Albuquerque. And it was like the most popular scene I'd ever seen in a town. I mean, like every, the whole place was packed, sold out. And I had never really seen the enthusiasm for the sport like I saw at, at that moment in my life. And I remember thinking, wow, this is a big deal in certain places. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in the UFC in particular, it's sort of, they really played up the idea of the commercial pay-per-view as opposed to the residential pay-per-view. They've got a mm-hmm. lot of deals um, through an external contractor, this, this um, company called Joe Hand Productions that helps mm-hmm. them set up deals with like Buffalo Wild Wings, Dave and Buster's. And they really try and make it a social event. If you can't get out to the fights, you know, don't just stay home and watch alone. Come, you know, spend 50 bucks at a Buffalo Wild Wings, you know, buy a bunch of beer for your friends and yeah. hot wings or whatever. So, yeah, they, you know, and that was one of Dana White's big fixations, too, was to really make it seem like an event. You know, they do up the arena like it's a discotheque. And if you've ever been to a live show, it's sort of they really ratchet up the lighting and the the um, audio levels of the music and the arena PA over the course of uh, a show until you get to the end and they just they cut the whole lights they fill it up with whatever color scheme the main event fighters are they just blast as loud as possible the walkout themes and it's just it, it's really an audio visual kind of overwhelming experience and you know you go to a place like buffalo wild wings it's crowded to the gills with people they have 25 flat screen tvs on every wall you know they have their own pa system that's sort of transmitting you know, a version of that intensity into this smaller space. It like it it can still feel like you're getting pretty close to that kind of manic discotheque kind of environment. Totally. So you start out the story by talking about Art Davy. Can you teach our listeners uh, who Art was and and why he was important to all this? Yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of debate about you know where to start the timeline of the UFC, but to me, I think Art Davy deserves the credit for it. Uh, he was a marketing executive um, who grew up in the East Coast. He was actually he was roommates with Donald Trump, he says, at um, in high school at the military mm-hmm. academy in, in Queens for a semester. Um, he wound up going serving in Vietnam, came back, got into um, used car sales. And he ended up on the West Coast in California and worked his way through used car sales in San Diego and eventually got a job in marketing through one of the marketing firms that worked for a car dealership that he had he had been a salesperson at at the time. Um, he's just, you know, he's a natural salesman. He's, you know, he appeared, you know, I mentioned in the book is sort of he did a bunch of stunt advertisements for his car dealership in San Diego. He worked for where mm-hmm. you know he jumped off a building you know, an eight story building and landed on a giant air mattress on the sidewalk below. He cinched himself up to a helicopter and kind of rode over San Diego, dangling from the bottom of this helicopter, put on a a Kevlar vest and had a gun fired at his chest as, you know, this is sort of like shock kind of commercials in the Mm seventies. So, you know, when he moved over to doing marketing full time, he put together a pitch for, uh, a client of his company that would wanted to um, increase the footprint of Modelo beer in the U.S. And so they were soliciting pitches from, you know, a marketing company about how different kinds of campaigns to kind of increase the, you know, the visibility and the brand value of Modelo. And Davey developed this idea over a couple of months working on this pitch for them um, to do a martial arts tournament something that he says was similar to a series of boxing broadcasts in the fifties that was sponsored by Gillette. they had a hair tonic for men in the fifties and they, they found a bunch of archival footage of great boxing fights from the forties and they rebroadcast them as a Gillette kind of sponsorship venue. 
And he thought you could do something similar, but with martial arts. And then eventually he was like, we don't need to do archival footage. We can just do a live broadcast. And uh, he came up with the idea of doing this kind of elimination tournament to see which martial art was the most effective in open combat with the fewest limitations possible. Um, and he was going to call it the War of the Worlds, brought to you by Modelo. Um, and so, you know, it was this big labor of love. He presented it to the client. The client kind of just brushed it aside in the meeting in about a minute and moved on. But in the course of working on that pitch, he got so excited about it that he kind of sold himself on it more than he had sold you know, his client. He decided to leave his job at the marketing firm and took all of his savings and decided he was going to spend a year or two working on trying to set up this idea of a, a martial arts tournament because he just was so excited by it. And so that's how he met the Gracies as part of that research. He had found this famous Playboy article that Horion Gracie had been the subject of as, you know, he was described as the baddest man on the planet. Mm -hmm. You know, he had this public challenge to Mike Tyson at the time. This would have been 1989, 1990, Mike Tyson's sort of heyday saying, you know, this 180 pound, you know, thin Brazilian guy says he could kill Mike Tyson in a street fight, you know, and he put $100,000 of his own money up um, to back the challenge. And so, you know, Davey went to him and uh, they founded this sort of company together to to start planning the first UFC. And that's really kind of how it all got rolling. And at that time, niche TV like this, uh, the primary way it would get to obviously the viewers was, you know, via satellite or cable, but really through pay-per-view. So what was the pay-per-view television market like in the 1990s? Can you give us examples of what you'd find on pay-per-view? Yeah, you could. I mean, at the time, it was a huge. It was it was a little bit like VR has been over the last decade or so. It was really it was a market that investors kept waiting to kind of take off. And every throughout the 80s, investors had really thought that pay-per-view would become the next big thing in media. And they'd really built up the infrastructure to sell pay-per-view kind of piggybacking off of subscription cable. Mm -hmm. Like if you can sell, you know, a set of premium cable channels to people in the suburbs for 30 bucks a month, you could probably also sell them individual shows. So, you know, they'll pay 30 bucks and then they'll pay 10 bucks to go see, um, you know, a concert like New Kids on the Block or Leonard yeah. Skinner. They're not going to come to your town. Maybe they're going to skip out on Ohio on this tour. But, you know, they're going to be in Chicago. And so you can spend 15 bucks to watch the show live. And, you know, for the record companies, it's just, you know, it's a nominal expense to have a satellite truck and a couple extra camera people um, at the concert already. But, you know, it it had this huge financial upside. And so uh, a lot of production companies and media conglomerates thought, you know, they really invested big in trying to create original pay-per-view programming. And this would encapsulate everything from the 1992 Olympics, where they NBC famously tried to sell every event as a standalone sort of pay-per-view package mm -hmm. um, to Howard Stern's like super raunchy kind of like hyper taboo. Like you don't get to see this on normal TV. So you're paying a premium. <laughs> Not allowed. Yeah. yeah, you're paying a premium for the amateur kind of like dirty, kind of like uncensored, you know, you can curse, you can have nudity, you can do all the stuff that's otherwise like prohibited from from normal TV. So they really invested in the full range, you know, the Metropolitan Opera in New York, you know, Howard Stern having a negligee party. And then, you know, they, another famous example is one of the companies or the company that wound up putting on the first UFC, Semaphore Entertainment Group. They did a whole range of pay-per-views, including, you know, they they started investing in stand up comedy specials. So, you know, one of their biggest hits was Andrew Dice Clay's um, first pay-per-view special after he had been you know, basically blacklisted in Hollywood. Sure. Um, they gave him an hour and a half long special um, to really play up a lot of the bigoted and homophobic shtick that he had. Um, they also did Battle of the Sexes, too, with Jimmy Connors and Martina Navratilova. 
you know, they did a lot of concerts. They did a lot of uh, different experimentation. And one of their executives, this guy Campbell McLaren, who had come out of the stand up comedy world, they'd given him uh, an assignment basically to come up with as many different original series ideas as possible for uh, pay-per-view broadcasts stuff that they could do that wasn't just a one-off, but that could be an original ongoing series. And so Art Davey brought the pitch to him after he had been turned down by Showtime and ESPN and Prime Ticket in LA and all these other traditional broadcasters. And he pitched Campbell and to Campbell and SEG, which who had had success with stuff like Andrew Dice Clay and kind of understood the pay-per-view market at that time. Howard Stern was doing really well, and this sort of taboo kind of shock value content tended to do the best out of everything. You know, famously, the Olympics was a big bomb for NBC in 1992. It was really the stuff like, you know, the butt bongo fiesta and that kind of stuff that viewers really wanted to see and were willing to pay for. So sure. Campbell kind of jumped on the idea and that's really what got the whole the whole ball running. So Davy strikes the deal with Semaphore to your point, um, but then they immediately run into you know an issue that became you know really a theme early on in UFC was okay you're going to host this pay per view event, who in the heck is going to sanction this fight with the state athletic commissions out there? I mean. It's really a testament to how quickly they produced the first event. It, they really had about six months of pre-production before they went live. Okay. Um, and to to get the show up and running that quickly, Davey had specifically targeted Colorado. You know, they had the first UFC in Denver because bare knuckle boxing was effectively legal there. The state at that time didn't have an athletic commission and didn't regulate uh, bare knuckle boxing or any other kind of combat sports so long as the competitors were above 18 years old. Um, so that kind of gave them a default um, approval. You know, they weren't approved by the state, but the state didn't have standing to shut them down just based on the the idea of martial arts competition. Sure. They, they weren't welcome back, though, after that. No, yeah, they've they faced uh, a lot of um, a lot of antagonism from Wellington Webb, who was the mayor of Denver at the time, who had no idea that the UFC was going to hold an event um, of at McNichols Arena of all places. That was, you know, the the big kind of crown jewel of Denver for as far as sports arenas. It's where the Denver Nuggets played, you know, and the UFC snuck in on an off night when the Nuggets were playing out of town. Um, so they were able to rent the arena out for four thousand dollars. And after the first UFC and all the sort of scandalous headlines, Wellington Webb went to the arena and made sure that the UFC couldn't use it for the second event. So they had to scramble at the last minute and they wound up in this much smaller uh, venue called the Mammoth Gardens in Denver. And then after that, they were effectively you know, blocked from Colorado. So they had to go to a bunch of other states like North Carolina, um, Alabama, places that, that weren't as hostile and weren't as sort of scared of the controversy or places where uh, there weren't athletic commissions. And in a lot of the early legal fights, they, they um, the UFC kind of continued to roll on this technicality that what they were doing was such a new sport that a lot of courts ruled that even in states like New York or Michigan, where there were athletic commissions, the commissions didn't have standing to regulate what the UFC was doing because, you know, mixed martial arts as a sport wasn't specifically enumerated in the laws and bylaws that had set up the commission. They, you know, they could do boxing, they could do basketball, they could do all these other sports, but there was no mention specifically of mixed martial arts. So a lot of courts kind of threw out the attempts of athletic commissions to try and prevent or shape um, what the UFC was doing in the early days, which allowed them to keep going in the face of all this controversy. But, you know, eventually that would prove to be a, a kind of a foolhardy strategy because it just created enemies at athletic commissions. And by the time 
you know, after a few years, all these commissions had updated their policies and worked with state legislators to to update the state laws about what could and couldn't be done under sort of athletic commission sanctioning. They had wound up specifically getting banned in you know, more than 30 states around the country. And they had really created a lot of enemies by sort of skating around state sanctioning. Yeah. So Davey settles on a $100,000 purse for this first event in Denver, half going to the winner. Yet another common theme we see across your book uh, comes up in even this original event, which is side agreements and secretly paying fighters extra guarantees. Do you look at this as the original sin? No, I, you know, I think, you know, I, I think the financial fantasy was always part of it. If you look at, you know, the prize for the first UFC was $50,000. That was triple the median, uh, household income in the U S at the time. Okay. So that was a real 1993. That was, you know, it wasn't like winning a billion dollars, but that was a real kind of, um, a valuable prize for most people and especially for like one night of work and the Davy paid um, every fighter that participated all eight fighters at the first UFC that would get a two thousand dollar honorarium minimum so for a lot of people that's a month's salary just for being willing to try their hand to win a one night tournament Mm -hmm. Um, he had to behind the scenes he paid a couple people extra including um Art Jimerson, who was a, a ranked boxer at the time and was getting close to title contention, um, he wound up paying him, I think, $17,000 um, secretly because he didn't want all the other fighters to know that they were willing to negotiate in order to get as diverse a group as possible to represent as many different you know, combat styles, martial sure. arts disciplines, um, to make the event seem more legitimate. But, you know, I think... In, in the early days, that the promise of that payout is really what drove the excitement of the sport. I mean, you hear a lot of, you know, I talk about Randy Couture in the book. He was an assistant wrestling coach at the time that uh, the USA, UFC debuted, and he was training to try and make the Olympic wrestling team. Uh, it had been his lifelong goal, and he was making something like $25,000 a year as a, an assistant wrestling coach. So he looked at this $50,000 payout and he looked at the athletic level that a lot of the fighters were at. And he was, you know, he thought, well, he could, as a highly trained, close to Olympic tier wrestler, he could clean out, you know, the entire bracket sure, and make double what he was making in a year. And that was just sort of as a side hustle. So it had this sort of like gambler's allure um, from the beginning. So I think people understood that they weren't it wasn't a career they were signing up for. It was kind of a gamble. It was a chance at winning a one time payout that would take off a lot of pressure and kind of help alleviate a lot of the financial stress that a lot of people were in, especially, you know, I mean, one of the the kind of back notes of of the book is, you know, how developed the American college and sort of Olympic wrestling scene was and how little opportunity there was for people in that scene to, you know, cash in on their skill and their reputation. You know, you'd be a world champion Olympic wrestler and then, you know, you'd end up at a university as an assistant coach and making twenty, twenty five, thirty thousand dollars a year. It was sort of an extreme disparity compared to the NBA or NFL. So the UFC really created a new path for, you know, this incredibly talented and experienced pool of athletes that were willing to compete for next to nothing. So R- R- Royce Gracie wins the first title. Uh, um, and you talk about in, in your in your writing, how incredible it was to watch this smaller man beat Ken Shamrock, um, which was kind of the audacity of the sport in some respects. Um, what did the reviews say coming out of that? Because you know the media did talk about this. Yeah, I mean, even today, you, th- you know, people have a bit of a chip on their shoulder about um, how involved the Gracies were in the early um, in the early UFCs, and a lot of competitors at the time thought it was all a setup to make Gracie Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, look like the you know the ultimate 
martial art form that could beat every other martial arts form. Um, even today, I, I interviewed someone last week for another story I'm working on that, you know, they still kind of look back on the first UFC as a giant infomercial, basically for Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Sure. Um, but coming out of the first UFC, there was a lot of criticism in Black Belt magazine and other, you know, martial arts forums about the rule set specifically favoring uh, Jiu Jitsu. Certainly none of the competitors in the first UFC outside of maybe Ken Shamrock and Taylor Tooley, not Taylor Tooley, um, Gerard G Gordo, mm -hmm. even knew who the Gracies were really. And even had an understanding of what jujitsu or ground fighting or, or grappling was, you know, th there was a lot of um, adjustment in the early days of the UFC of the rule set to try and appease some of these criticisms specifically from karate practitioners or Kung Fu practitioners, you know, who said, you know, they, they were kind of sore that, um, the most effective karate strikes like throat strikes, groin strikes, you know, eye gouges were prohibited. So it made it look like their art wasn't effective, not because it wasn't, but because, you know, their most effective techniques were banned in order to make it look like submission grappling was actually the, the most effective. So, you know, you had... You know, there's a couple of UFCs where groin strikes were legal and you have these absurd kind of moments where two fighters are just on the ground hitting each other in the cup over and over and over again. <laughs> well, and also, I think you do a good job explaining that really that was kind of Bob Merowitz's folly at, at Semaphore was he didn't try to kind of bend to what the athletic commissions needed and that caused him to stay banned versus, you know, enter Dana White stage left he was immediately intrigued uh, by this, and he also had a background and friends that would be interested in this, too. Yeah. I, I mean, the funny thing about Dana White and the Fertitta, Dana White has said this, that he didn't really like the UFC when it came out. He thought it was ridiculous. Dana White, obviously, he has a background in boxing. He wanted to be a pro boxer for a, a brief period and trained and had a couple of amateur fights. Um and then decided to go instead into um, training and uh, managing fighters. And, you know, he decided he didn't have the heart for fighting. But he, he did kind of think the UFC was ridiculous. He said that in the past. It wasn't until he met uh, a trainer who had fighters in the UFC, this guy John Lewis, uh, who invited him and the Fertitas to come out to the gym to try it for themselves, that he really started to develop an appreciation for how effective jujitsu was as a, as a self-defense technique and how much depth there was in what from the outside to the untrained eye could just look like two sweaty men kind of rolling Grappling. around on top yeah. of each other. Once you feel that, once you feel the pressure and the specific angles and just how dire some of those situations can be that, you know, from the outside don't necessarily look like that much. It really, you know, sold them on the drama and excitement of the sport. Um, and I think the thing Dana White had and the Fertitas had that Myrowitz didn't uh, was money. And, uh, you know, people talk a lot about Myrowitz's and Semaphore's kind of missteps throughout the 90s. But, you know, in retrospect, I think they did about as well as they could do um, sure. for the circumstance. You know, they found themselves trying to manage this enormous cultural touchstone. And, you know, this thing that was a runaway hit almost from the beginning and sort of juggling, you know, keeping that production pipeline going and fighting the legal battles they had to to keep the next event going, to keep the revenue stream going, while also kind of managing the sport and working with um, legislators and commissioners. You know, it was a really hard juggling act. And as a New York media company, not, you know, it was very different from what the Fertitas were. They were, you know, extremely connected politically in Nevada. Um, they had a billion dollar a year gaming company in station casinos. So, you know, they really had money to fall back on. They had money that they could afford to lose um, to keep the to keep the company going in a way that Myrowitz and Semaphore did not. 
And so Meyerowitz, you know, when he found himself losing money on each show, you know, his backlog of money, like he, he had no money to fall back on. So he's had to start just going out to find outside investors. And, you know, he couldn't find that many. It was it became a struggle in part sure. because, you know, he had lost after seven, eight years, he had lost the sort of the public opinion fight um, because he had sort of accrued so many enemies during this period where they were trying to keep the company going. Well, including, I think, on the athletic commission there in Nevada, like Mark Ratner was someone who you mentioned that was averse to this, but was on very good standing with the Fertitta family to where, I mean, they could effectively grease the skids. But also something you mentioned uh, early on in the book was, you know, the World Wrestling Federation was out there at the time, what we now know as WWE, you know, post their famous lawsuit. And they were really the contractual model for the UFC even to today. Can you explain how WWE treated their, you know, their wrestlers and entertainers and, and therefore why that was beneficial for the UFC to copy? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, in short, they treated their wrestlers badly and <laughs> took almost every right um, away from their wrestlers in order to control everything under a central brand. And Lorenzo Fertitta said that, you know, he had come from the world of gaming and gambling and didn't necessarily know a lot about running a media company um, or a sporting company. And so the first thing he did after he closed on the deal with Myrowitz to buy the UFC was he got every um, contract he could get, every business file he could find on the WWE, it was WWF at that time, um, in order to try and model um, the UFC on, on some of the things that had made the WWE work. And arguably the most effective thing that they had going for them at that time was these expansive contracts with their wrestlers, which um, made every wrestler under contract with the WWF, whether it was superstars like The Rock or these small guys that you've never heard of that were um, wrestling exclusively on the regional seen in you know the weekly shows that wouldn't end up being televised um the wwe owned everything they did in terms of the characters they created in terms of the costumes they might have come up for themselves storylines they would have written for themselves these wrestlers were even if those characters had been created before they signed with the wwf once they signed with the wwf the wwf took ownership of those creative assets they had to participate in promotional promotional uh, appearances, interviews, appearances, yeah. sign posters, do anything for no extra compensation. WWF retained lifetime rights to their appearance and likeness to use in video games or magazines or any other kind of form, DVD sales. Anything they wanted to exploit to generate revenue in the future, there was no, you know, period of expiration where after five years, you know, The Rock gets his video rights back and he can sure. go sell DVDs of his own fights. Um, so it was just a wide sweeping, ultra exploitive contract. And a lot of those same provisions ended up in UFC fighter contracts and they're still in the contracts today. So the Fertitas, um, they get the athletic commission to pass off. Uh, and so the first UFC that would be held in Las Vegas is at the Mandalay Bay um, between Tito Ortiz and Vitor uh, Belfort. Was this really kind of like the lift off of what we know as today's UFC? Um, no, not really. I mean, this was sort of, this was the beginning of a long series of failed experiments that I think Dana and the Fertitas um, tried and in their early years of running the UFC to try and, and reshape public perception around what the brand was. Um, sure. In those early days, they spent lavishly in, on stuff like indoor laser shows, indoor fireworks. Um, a lot of the early shows in 2001 that you can go see, you know, you'll just see clouds of smog hanging in the arena and fighters walking out with towels covering their mouths because they had indoor fireworks and those indoor fireworks 
would add a hundred thousand dollars or more to the cost, the production costs of each event for like no real benefit. Sure. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on celebrity. They, you know, famously hired Carmen Electra to be the company spokesperson in 2001, even though she had no real relationship to martial arts and didn't know any fighters wasn't, but it fit their target consumer though. Right. That was their core constituent back to your 18 to 35. That well, they be, thought so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's what the, the, um, the idea was that they could rebrand, um, the promotion just through association. And, you know, you look at a lot of those early shows, Cindy Crawford is in the VIP section with Randy Gerber, who's a, a big Vegas figure in the business community and who's friends with the Fertitta brothers, Shaquille O'Neal would come out. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on recruiting celebrities to kind of appear on camera. So hoping that it would transfer like, Oh, if this is good enough for Cindy Crawford and Shaquille O'Neal, like if they're not disturbed by this, you know, why are you? <laughs> yeah. But you know, it didn't really work that way. Right. I think, it took them a few years to figure out that the trick in the fight game, and this is sort of still true today, is not about the vanity or the spectacle necessarily. It's about creating a compelling story about the fighters themselves. Sure. And I think that a lot of what the Fertitas and Dana White got wrong in those years and spent extravagantly to try and, and do and lost a lot of money chasing that sort of dragon was building up everything around the cage rather than the fighters inside the cage. And once they settled on that reality show format where you could really kind of soak into the lives and backstories of, you know, basically unknown amateur fighters that had been competing on the regionals, you know, once people got a chance to learn their backstories and to see how much sacrifice and dedication they had to, you know, this dream of becoming a professional fighter, that immediately gave the fights a lot more richness and drama. And it it created a path into caring about the sport that, you know, Cindy Crawford or Randy Gerber, or Shaquille O'Neal just couldn't give the average fan. Well, to your point, I mean, uh, Joe Rogan shows up as the color commentator. And again, it was about this idea of kind of passion, like the draw to the sport um, and, and the draw to being there right around those fighters for for him as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's the power Rogan kind of coming coming onto the scene. He really, you know, he he uses hyperbole just naturally. It's just part of his vernacular. And the reverence that he had for these people and the way he would just consistently talk about, you know, people that in another context would have been a punchline. Like when Tito Ortiz went on the Jay Leno show in 2003 to try and get him to come out to Vegas to see him fight Randy Couture, um, you know, and Leno is kind of laughing him off as some kind of dumb cage fighter. But then, you know, you hear Rogan talk about Tito Ortiz and he's like a world class athlete, a trained assassin. Like, you know, the, that degree of reverence, I think, transferred to the audience as well, where you, you're not just seeing how much, you know, the fighters care and how sympathetic their backstories could be. But then you're hearing this familiar, this familiar person sort of talk about them in in this sort of like reverential way it, it created a, a totally different sort of frame around the ufc and it helped people that weren't familiar with martial arts it gave them a language to begin talking about it in their own life with their own friends who describe some of the more technical aspects of jujitsu or grappling or you know because you know even caring about the fighters, there's still a lot about mixed martial arts that was foreign to a lot of ordinary fans where, you know, even just the basic language of, you know, what is mount or side control or what's a go-go plata or, a, you know, a, um, you know, what's a one, two, you know, it's a one, two, three, um, you know, but having little bits of jargon to throw in and sort of learn while also kind of participating in this fan reverence that Joe Rogan helped them model. It really sunk the hooks in, I think, for a, a mass market kind of culture to form around the brand. So Kevin K becomes pivotal uh, at Spike TV. 
Um, you, you do, I, I think there's a couple points in this book where you do such a good job of explaining some of the demographics and also the economics at play, you know, in the early 2000s versus the mid 2000s. And I think, I think, uh, like any reader in your book can go to, I mean, you could be a, a 20 year old kid and have some understanding of what was happening at the time through your book, which I think is excellent. Um, but, but Spike really played into this kind of from multiple angles um, it not only had the demographic that was likely to meet this, um, it also was in some ways attached the hip with WWE as well. Um, can you kind of teach us a little more about what Kevin K and Spike put together? Uh, yeah, sure. It, it's it's an interesting his Kevin K is an unusual character in his own right. Is he he largely came out of the world of um, family entertainment and animation. He had been an executive at Nickelodeon. Um, and worked on managing a bunch of animated series for Nickelodeon. And when Spike was created, Spike was originally, um, it it was originally a country focused channel, um, called TNN and, um, Viacom wanted to rebrand it because they already had their own, um, country channel. So they wanted to rebrand, um, TNN as something different to pursue a different kind of audience. And so they had an internal kind of contest to see who could come up with the best concept for the channel. The the winning concept ended up being this sort of male focus prestige network for young men, 18 to 34, which in the mid 2000s, early 2000s, that was the most lucrative um, marketing demographic you could in um, cable television, in part because that demographic wasn't watching television anymore. Hard, hard is, to get to. Yeah. Yeah. The beginning of the Internet age. These were guys that were more interested in video games and, you know, file sharing and just online message boards like they didn't they weren't watching Friends and Seinfeld and ER, The Bachelor, Survivor, <laughs> whatever, whatever was big on television at the time. So the, so because of that, cable channels could charge a, a extravagant amount for any kind of programming that had a high percentage of these these guys in the audience. And so Viacom went all in on trying to create a channel that was just about attracting those those kind of um, viewers. And so they that came up with the idea of Spike and they had actually inherited a media licensing deal with WWE or WWF at the time. Um, And so that was a big success for them. But they also, you know, they had a limited budget. They, you know, even though they were backed by Viacom, Viacom had only given them around seventy five million dollars a year to pay for, you know, their full broadcasting budget. So they had to come up with you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year of programming with $75 million to split up between funding original programming or acquiring licensing rights for reruns or older archival stuff. So it was a real kind of puzzle for Kevin K to kind of split up that, that pretty limited sum. And one of the best bets he thought was to get something related to sports. So he really wanted to create a new sport. That's that's what he told me when I spoke to him. He was really looking for a way to invest in something that would be kind of equivalent to the NFL or NBA for the 21st sure. century for this new generation of young men. And he tried something with um, slam ball, which was this very short-lived attempt, to sort of like a circus basketball game. It was basically three on three basketball with um, trampolines on the court. So you would get these like unbelievable highlight reel kind of ready slam dunks, um, which initially got a lot of people interested in the sport. But then it interest kind of waned because people sort of realized not not unlike slap fighting today, there wasn't a lot of sport there. It was just a series of highlights kind of duct taped together, but there wasn't actually like an internal sort of drama to the game itself. But by the way, real quick on that, I just saw slap fighting last night because I had peaked it. I think it was Joe Rogan's Twitter 
and slap fighting was up on it. And I just, I was blown away that that was actually going on. It's real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's real. It's, it's real. It's depressing and to watch. Like watching people go out cold is depressing. <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, if, if you just saw that on Twitter, scrolling through in between 20 other things that are occupying your mind, you know, you might think it's like interesting or something or be yeah, at least you, do. you stop and watch it. some videos. Yeah. Yeah. But when you watch a two hour program or an hour long program of that, it really, it doesn't quite <laughs> have the same, um, same drama. Um, but that was kind of the same thing with, with slam ball, you know, it was, it was all highlights and eventually you just kind of go numb from just seeing the highlight over and over again. It's like you lose the appreciation for, the specialness of it. So, so Kay found um, through a couple different sources, he got hooked up with the UFC. Dana White and the Fertitas had been trying to sell uh, media licensing rights for the UFC in North America for a long time. No one wanted to buy them. You know, they'd had some marginal success here or there, some marginal interest, but none of the big networks, no big cable channels were really willing to take a, a big bite out of the UFC. Um, but K case, case cites two sources that brought the UFC to him. One was um, an intern who had just graduated from NYU and had grown up watching the UFC on pirated VHS tapes and DVDs. And, you know, he says all his friends in the dorm were, you know, trading these tapes. They were all big cage fighting fans. And so, you know, as an intern, he brought you know, one of these DVD compilations to Kevin Kay and said, you should consider this for Spike. And another source was uh, another Spike executive, a talent acquisition executive who had, I think, heard that the Fertitas and White were pitching this and told Kay he should take a meeting with them. So eventually in um, late 2003, early 2004, Kay agrees to meet with White and the Fertitas um, And they don't have a particularly good meeting, but Kay is interested in finding a way. He he sees the value in the UFC. He just doesn't see a way around the controversy. And he was a skeptic of putting fights on TV alone. So you needed a different way to package the UFC other than just, you know, a two hour night of fights, which is what White and the Fertitas had originally pitched to him. And so they spent, you know, five, six months going back and forth with meetings, trying to come up with different concepts. And eventually they settle on a reality show where it wouldn't be fights, but it would be 16 fighters living in a house in the traditional kind of reality show formula, all competing for a chance at a UFC contract. Once Kay heard that, And once the Fertitas presented it as something that Spike wouldn't have to pay for themselves, they presented it as a barter deal, which would mean that the UFC would self-finance the full production of the series and give the rights to Spike in exchange for a cut of the advertising revenue. So that $75 million budget that Kay had to work with for the year, he wouldn't have to spend a penny of that on this series It was an original series, so it wasn't going to be like reruns that they're going to have to try and, you know, polish up and make seem exciting again. It was original first run content, but he didn't have to spend a penny on it. So he he dove at the chance. And uh, that's really kind of what brought the UFC back out of that five, six year slump it had been in after Semaphore had sort of really started losing some of those big political battles in the 90s. When I think you pointed out that what uh, the Ultimate Fighter was replacing was Takeshi's Castle, which if if you've never seen Takeshi's Castle for our listeners, I highly recommend you Google it. It is very funny content. It's cheap content, but at the same time, think of the excitement of going from laughing your head off at that kind of content versus now you're into a storyline, you're invested in people's lives, and you're watching people fight. That's a completely different world. They had this big idea for what the, the channel would be. Kevin Kay's boss at the time um, had sort of created this idea that Spike would be the, you know, the equivalent of Esquire for young men, but as a cable channel like Esquire magazine. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and as a pitch, you know, as a, a PowerPoint presentation, you're like, oh, that'll that's that works great. But then when you see how they had to execute that with seventy five million dollars, you know, and it's like they didn't have a lot of options to do something that elegant. So they really they, Takeshi's Castle was something. It was an 80s, the 1980s series from Japan that they got a very cheap licensing deal for They're just air reruns of it. And they just paid a very small fee to have uh, American voice actors kind of talk over top of this uh, Japanese you know, stunt show basically, where it was, it was a bunch of different contestants each week taking turns trying to run through these elaborate, um, these elaborate stunt kind of obstacle courses, and it's a lot of slapstick humor and stuff. But very like, funny, yeah, yeah, very cheap too. Very, yeah, you know. yeah, very hot. I mean, you think it goes to show you, like, if it makes you laugh and it's cheap content, it becomes highly profitable, though. Um, so let's let's pivot because I, I think in thinking about this, you know, you've, we've kind of talked about. There's almost like an audaciousness to the sport where, um, you know, it has that aspect of like it needs to draw eyeballs. It needs to be incredible. But you also need to, as you mentioned earlier, people got to be invested in, in the things that go outside the ring. Dana White was fully opposed to female fighters at one point. OK, did it just suddenly become with Ronda Rousey? OK, this will draw people to the sport. Therefore, we should do it. A large part of it was that I think another part was that he saw how dominant Ronda Rousey was being. Sure. You know, women have have been a part of the UFC from the beginning in a lot of ways. You know, the very first UFC, you know, I kind of mentioned this in the book, arguably the most credible commentator at the, fir the first UFC was Kathy Long, who was a champion yeah. kickboxer at the time. And. You know, she was as insightful as anybody on the broadcast team. Um, and in, in those early days, um, Don Fry and um, Dan Severin, they trained with uh, Becky Levi, who was a judoka and had specialized in physical education. And she really helped them train and, and build up their own fight games. And she would later compete in women's mixed martial arts in some of the early shows that had women fighting in the 90s. Um, so, you know, they had, they had always kind of been there um, in the periphery. Um, but seeing someone like Ronda Rousey, who had this Mike Tyson sort of appeal in terms of she's just finishing every fight in the first round. You know, sure. it wasn't like, you know, even Gina Carano, who, you know, had her sort of brief rise in 2007, 2008. Um, you know, she wasn't like this terrifying great white shark of a human being that, you know, was an unstoppable force of nature. It was really she was a super tough woman and she had a lot of tough kind of brawls for um, elite XC strike force. But, um, you know, you could see where she might be vulnerable also. But Ronda Rousey, she just dominated people. She didn't fight people. She dominated people. And I think it was that combination of knowing that some of the UFC's biggest competitors at the time were having success by promoting women's fights and then seeing Rousey in particular emerge as this, you know, extraordinary dominant figure. And then, you know, the third factor is she was beautiful and she yeah. was blonde haired, you know, very traditionally feminine appearance, like wasn't, you know, wasn't sort of like, controversial in any way just played right into the sexist tropes of you know men's publishing at the time just fit hand in glove with what everyone assumed an ideal woman should look like um it was just you know three for three and so you know the last real obstacle was that she was under contract with strike force ronda rousey was which was one of the UFC's biggest competitors at the time. And the UFC acquired Strike Force. So then suddenly they had Ronda's contract. And so they brought her over. So then, you know, after Ronda, you know, uh, enter Conor McGregor, right? And to your point, like someone investing in the life of the fighter, um, I think you talked about the number of pay-per-view buyers coming out of Ireland to watch him at one point. And then he fights in Vegas and 10% of the entire audience 
uh, flew, flew from Ireland just to watch him. I think, he, you know, he really typifies in your writing and, and this storytelling, you know, that story behind the fighter, how people bought into him as a fighter. Yeah. You know, it was part of the company's push into international markets to kind of build their business and to sort of supplement. You know, they're still incredibly reliant on pay-per-view and pay-per-view is almost exclusively a, a North American uh, revenue stream, not exclude there to get pay-per-view in other markets like Australia and um, Canada. But it was really the U.S. market that had, you know, the, the biggest financial value. And that also made the UFC incredibly vulnerable. So, you know, starting in 2007, they really started putting an emphasis on building out their international licensing business as a way to kind of hedge any shortfalls they might have or ratings dips or pay-per-view dips in the North American market by signing as many deals as they could internationally. And part of that sure. was putting on more shows in places like Ireland, the UK, Germany, um, Australia, went back to Japan, you know, just Brazil, Mexico, everywhere they could go, they wanted to go so that, you know, they could have as diversified and, and sort of viable uh, a company as possible. And part of that also, it helped them manage labor costs. Sure. Because fighters coming from other markets, they, you know, a lot of them were willing to fight for even less than fighters in the U.S. were willing to fight for. They had a, a lot more incentive. They were coming from places with depressed economies or where work was, was harder to come by. And that, you know, if they could succeed on an international platform, you know, that would immediately create this flashpoint of national pride, which I think happened with Conor McGregor. And, you know, the story famously was that he was living on uh, welfare, 200 euro a week welfare, check um he was unemployed and just training full-time to ch chase this dream of becoming a world champion mixed martial artist to kind of avoid having to live this depressing reality of being a tradesman or a plumber which is what he worked as briefly when i'm gonna i'm gonna quote from your book uh quote in just over two years he had traveled through the whirling magic of exponential growth where money had magically come from money the way chips seemed to replicate almost on their own on a streak at the craps table. Passerby brought to a standstill by the infectious glow of good fortune, end quote. A, I love playing craps tables whenever I get the chance. Um, and the B part of that is that was a perfect analogy for thinking about not only McGregor, but just in how this was like a game. This was like a massive casino act. Um, you know, like Rousey was a hot craps table and there was a crowd and the drinks were flowing and it was tons of fun. And same with McGregor. But on the flip side, they crapped out. They eventually had to crap out. Mm hmm. Well, I mean, that's that's another reality of mixed martial arts. It's too complicated for anyone to master for any period of time. Sure. So, you know, eventually Conor McGregor will meet, a, you know, Dagestani wrestler like Habib Nurmagomedov, who's been wrestling for 25 years, his entire adult life. And there's no amount of training that Conor McGregor or someone that started training or fighting professionally at 18, that you just can't catch up after a certain point. So sure. as good a puncher as you might be or a kicker, eventually you're going to find someone in another discipline that can beat you. Same with Ronda Rousey. As good at judo and grappling as you might be, there's an Olympic boxer out there that can just keep you at distance so that you can never even start your grappling game. And so, you know, everyone eventually loses. And to a certain extent, the, the UFC can kind of have a substantial influence on when that happens by choosing, you know, what kind of risks to expose their fighters to at what stage in their career. So they can kind of put a thumb on the scale of how long these craps runs to kind of continue the metaphor go. And they can kind of pick and choose like when it's time to press and try and build up, you know, a fighter who might be on a streak. But, you know, the streaks also, you know, like, you know, like we were discussing, I think maybe before we started recording for a lot of these fighters, you know, the majority of their earning power comes after they start losing. 
You know, yeah. they for fighters, they cash out on their losses. So the wins are what sort of allow them to renegotiate new contracts and get better terms than they could have as just young prospects or new signees. But once they establish themselves as, you know, highlight real world champions that can bring in a million pay-per-views and have, you know, half of Ireland fly over to Las Vegas to watch them fight in an arena. Now they can start earning pay-per-view points. Now they can start, you know, pushing for million dollar purses and all these secret side letter agreements for even more than the standard UFC contract would pay them. And then, you know, when the wheels fall off and they start losing, well, they're already they've leveled up now so that they're making more from their losses than they ever made from their wins. And certainly well, like true about, of Conor McGregor. Yeah, his biggest win of his life uh, was actually, you know, his fight against uh, Floyd Mayweather, which, you know, became started as kind of like a social media back and forth fun and games um, you know, kind of reminds me of Elon and Mark Zuckerberg possibly going at it, for example, um, and to, to an all out Vegas style fight. And I think the other thing that uh, our listeners, ha- you know, have to read this book for is, uh, Michael, I think you do such a great job in fight explaining what's going on, what transpires, how the reader should think about it. Because um, after I read the book, you had you really done, done a good job of explaining that McGregor was punching and landing but not with power, okay? And so I actually, before this podcast, uh, uh, recording this with you last night, I went back and watched the first nine rounds of that fight uh, at home. And I, I thought of two things. A, how accurate you were. He landed a lot of punches, but didn't do it with power. And, and I watched Mayweather, how often when he'd go to punch, even on a miss, he was turning his full back. In other words, shifting his, his hips into the punch. But then I also thought about the difference between Uh, fighting with boxing gloves versus what they do in the MMA, where it's more bare knuckles, right? When you get hit, it's going to feel in a, in a boxing glove, you need to punch with force because of the the padding of the glove. Yeah. It's a subtle difference, but a a massive one at the same time, you know, just as a spectator, you know, it kind of looks like the same thing. It's just a jab, right? But the effectiveness of it requires a completely different technique about how you root yourself at the feet, how you, you know, position your fist, the kind of timing you place on it. And in part, that's because in MMA, you know, when you jab, you're risking someone shooting underneath a jab to try and take you down for a wrestling takedown. You know, there's a whole part of the fight that just doesn't exist in boxing. Yeah, you're half committed in that case. Yeah. So everything about your weight transference and and everything else from ground up about how the punch is constructed and timed and how the conditions for that window of timing, it's sort of poking through. It's just it's it's completely different. Um, And, you know, it it was not unlike the Nurma Gamedov fight where it's sort of, you know, it, it it was an activity filled fight, but it. At no point was it especially competitive to my mind and by what it looked like to me. Um, There was no point where it it seemed like, you know, in spite of everything McGregor had said in the buildup, it's just it just takes one punch and all this other stuff. You're too old. You're too small. Everything else. Well, you know, I kind of write this in the book, but he got that punch in the first round, that famous uppercut you see again and again in the highlights now. You know, he got that flush power punch. And that's one of the most powerful punches you can land on someone in part because most people don't see uppercuts coming. They just completely surprise you. And you see Mayweather's head whip completely back. And that was the punch McGregor had promised would knock him out. And you see how little effect it actually had and how everything about McGregor's game as an MMA striker was suddenly just reoriented into boxing it was like oh it's gonna take 20 of those not one you know in the ufc that might have been a knockout punch totally but in boxing you know it's just like no you have to do that 20 times and you know the difficulty of setting that up and conditioning your opponent to continually be open to that kind of punch that's just a vanishing window over the course of 12 rounds with someone as experienced as mayweather Agree. I, I was also really impressed with the, the tempo, 
the changing from Southpaw to Orthodox. All, I mean, you could see the pure athleticism that Conor McGregor can bring to any fight, even if he's, to your point, he's completely out of style and technique for the sport. Uh, it's impressive. Let's, let's, flip, let's flip over to um, Ari Emanuel, because he obviously he represented the UFC for years as a client. Um, he ends up, you know, going on this rampage of taking Endeavor. He rolls William Morris agency into it. He rolls the sports agency IMG into it. And then ultimately comes after UFC um, to be the buyer to take out the Fertitas. Um, what was the rationale for putting all these different, you know, clientele lists and entertainment assets together? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a million dollar question. It's, it's well, sort of he, like the, he, he would say it's the billion dollar question. Right? Yeah, it's the mystery <laughs> box. It's the J.J. Abrams mystery box. I mean, it's there is no point like there is there's nothing inside the box. It's just pure cancerous growth. It's growth without purpose. You know, it's sort of, you know, it goes back to, I think, Ari's original sort of motivation as as a, an agent. There was a great interview that he gave, a very short interview, and he was listed at one of these Hollywood reporter, you know, most powerful young people, up and comers in, in the industry. And they asked him what his ambitions were and he or what his his ambitions for the future and he said besides power and money i don't have any i'm still trying to figure it out and i think <laughs> he still hasn't figured it out but he's just on this acquisitive quest where i think you know the more he can sort of sweep under his his ownership banner the the more purpose he thinks he'll have but when you look at the individual pieces none of it connects really it's all just sort of opportunistic and what he can do at the time with the resources he has available but there is no vision he doesn't have a vision he just has he has power and leverage and access to capital and fear people are afraid of him and that's it and so so he can just ping pong around the industry inhaling these bizarre bull riding f1 you know he tried to and failed ufc you know wwe i well yeah so i don't i don't in that respect access to capital etc you know originally when i was reading your book i thought well you know you could kind of see where they could take their agents and go to these fighters and kind of roll out their brands make fees off of selling them to other sponsorships and products so that part made some sense um, you know, to me, but to your point, I also think a lot about the UFC deal they put together, right? They bring in Silver Lake. Um, they're using just the dirt cheapest interest rates of all time to put this deal together. Uh, by the way, to your point, a deal that could never get put together ever again. It would never be allowed. The, when the Fed Reserve has to ask about the, de- the deal terms, you, you know that it's levered. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree with that. But I think another little interesting tidbit that you put in the book, and I felt like, oh, I was like, well, this is why God um, set us up to talk about this book. Um, you mentioned George Gilder uh, and how Ari was influenced by George Gilder's book, Life After Television. And how he, you know, he looked, uh, Gilder really has built out this framework for the network effect of our lives that was going to, you know, overrun with what he thought, I think he, you know, he thought the internet was going to be big, but he didn't know exactly how it was going to play out other than tens of thousands of networks. And in, interestingly, when you mentioned that, it just made me chuckle because um, I'm, I'm on the board of Discovery Institute in Seattle, which is was co-founded by Gilder. And I've, we've done a podcast with Gilder on his life after Google and look forward to doing his new book that he recently launched. But um, I'm also on the programming committee for COSM, which is a big conference that, that it, uh, Discovery hosts up in Bellevue, uh, Washington with Gilder. And I met Hari Emanuel at COSM two years ago, funny enough. And my interest to your point was, you know, he's been around the entertainment business for so long. I wanted to ask him about Warner Brothers Discovery that was getting put together in that, you know, the latter part of, of that year when I met him. But when you look at, you know, what's now WWE and UFC, they're announced as of this spring to be rolled together into this kind of co-listed asset this is referred to as TKO Holdings. Well, I mean, is this just you do it because you can do a deal and and put it out to investors? Is it is this just deal making, not really trying to make the best of the asset? I actually I think this is trying to make the best of the asset, the, the okay. merger with WWE in part because 
you know, the UFC is a mature business now and WWE has been a mature business for a long time. Sure. Um, so they're at a point now where they're both big. You know, the UFC makes a billion dollars a year plus every year now that, you know, it's still a fraction of the NFL, but it's a billion dollars is a billion dollars. That's a massive business unto itself. A lot of money. Yep. So I think in putting them together, Ari is just sort of helping to create more growth out of two mature businesses by like trying to, you know, like he can go to sponsors now and say, you know, instead of doing a $20 million deal with Nemiroff Vodka or whatever, how about you do a $35 million deal and we'll spread you across the UFC and WWE. We'll do some like specific fighter placements. We'll put you on the, you know, I'm just sort of inventing a term here for Nemiroff. I'm not a hundred percent sure how much Nemiroff is paying, but like sure. just as an example, he can get more out of sponsors by packaging together two mature kind of platforms instead of doing one one off and you know both both companies have struggled with ratings and pay-per-view buys and streaming numbers you know wwe had its famous challenges trying to launch its own streaming service and transition its pay-per-view business to streaming and subscription which you know had some had some you know, some favorable and some unfavorable kind of outcomes to it. And the UFC now we're starting to see, uh, you know, a lot of cracks in, you know, what has been, you know, 30 years, not 30, let's say, let's say 20, 20 years of pretty continuous growth. Sure. You know, the, the most recent ratings of people, you know, this has been the headline the last couple of weeks, the Conor McGregor season of the ultimate fighter has just had disastrous ratings on ESPN, the cable channel, not the streaming side, but the, you know, they're getting three and 400,000 viewers per episode for the UFC's biggest star. I mean, it's hard. It's hard if you're Ari Emanuel to look at numbers like that and then go into Bob Iger and say, Hey, we want double our media. <laughs> yeah. Like they used to be able to do a spike. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's it's an interesting pattern, too, if you look back at, you know, Spike is long gone now that like that whole concept, you know, that turned into the Paramount Network and that turned into Paramount Plus. Like, you know, it's another sort of point I argue a little bit in the book is that the UFC has really sort of taken advantage of industries in decline that the pay-per-view market in the 90s was really at the end of its sort of growth spurt people were starting to realize that there wasn't actually as big a market for original pay-per-view programming as they had hoped for in the 1980s and the ufc was kind of the last gasp of that and then you know the second life the ufc had with reality television in the mid-2000s that was in a lot of ways that was the last gasp of cable television before the streaming era where you know people slowly started canceling their cable subscriptions and turning to the internet for culture and content instead of tv and radio and they were able to charge premiums to these you know mature businesses in their own right like viacom or espn or fox sports that were hoping to just hold on to their position in the market by trying to find premium content that would sort of continue to justify that. And I think, you know, you you could argue maybe that the ESPN is kind of at the end of their rope now, too, where it's just they're never going to be what they were in the 90s. ESPN is. And so the idea of paying premiums to someone like Ari and Dana White for UFC content may no longer make sense. Sure. What also, because your point that before they were attaching to a platform, now they kind of have to be the platform. And the one thing in media lately is, I mean, even the platforms are having trouble today. So, so it, it's like, you know, if you can't be the platform, you're going to be subject to the other platforms in effect. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's interesting if you go on ESPN.com right now, you'll see, Go click the MMA tab. ESPN is clearly hedging their bets by also broadcasting the PFL. ESPN Plus is also making the um, pay-per-view of the Jake Paul and Nate Diaz boxing match this weekend. I saw that. I was yeah. I was actually thinking that would be fun to watch after reading your book. Yeah. So like, there's you know, they're they're very sort of conscious of 
um, making sure the UFC isn't their only um, option in terms of continuing to have a presence in mixed martial arts um, going forward, in part to, I think, you know, lessen the amount of leverage that the UFC has had on a lot of other um, broadcasting partners because they control so many of the top fighters in the world through these exclusive contracts they have with fighters. So, I mean, we'll see. Everyone is sort of, you know, I mean, the UFC will not be bankrupt. Ari is not going to end up homeless on the streets. You know, he is sure. he's already a success story. He won already. Dana White. Yeah, won. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. The Fertitta's won. This is first all, world like, problems. Yeah. First world problems. Yeah. And, you know, declines in mature businesses are not doomsday scenarios either. They're totally. just sort of difficulties. And so I think it'll be interesting to see. um what happens with the next round of media rights. We saw this happen with um, the apparel sponsorship the UFC had with uh, Reebok. They had the seven year deal with Reebok and that, you know, they hit a wall in negotiations where Reebok, you know, they decided not to re up the deal and UFC, I think had wanted originally to get an even more lucrative kind of blue chip sponsor for the apparel with like, under armor or nike or one of these other like top tier athletic companies and they wound up with venom which you know in a lot of ways is a smaller brand than reebok um for what sounds like an equivalent amount of money it was sort of like a sidestep deal and a lot of people have described it as kind of a placeholder deal and i think bundling the the brand together with wwe which if you look back over that 20 year period, the UFC and WWE, they were kind of stocking horses for one another. So when the UFC took off, Spike decided to drop WWE because WWE was expensive. They still had a limited broadcasting budget and, you know, Vince was difficult to work with so, yeah. and the ratings weren't necessarily there either. So they went all in on UFC and the same when Fox Sports lost the UFC to ESPN, they signed on for WWE. They're like, this is a similar audience. It's sort of males, 30, yeah. 40 year old males now. You know, we can still kind of hit that and provide that that audience reach to the advertisers and get that revenue. To your ESPN point, the exclusivity, um, you know, you talked about the exclusivity to these fighters or 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 whatnot. Um how incredible was Fight Island for the pandemic? I mean, I just think of like, it was the only thing you could watch on TV for live sports and they owned the only live sport going on at the time. I think Fight Island in a lot of ways was a, it was a distraction that kept, and it was a fundraising opportunity. Ari, you know, he got a substantial amount of money um, out of that deal you know, that was sort of the genius. Like I've been talking to some smaller promoters in the U.S. And, you know, they have to pay venues site fees to to get, you know, arenas to let them host shows at, you know, some of these different like venues around the country. But the UFC is big enough now where they'll have venues or even, you know, governments pay the UFC to bring shows to to their location. So I think that's kind of what fight island was but um i think in terms of the covid shutdown that was you know i kind of point to this in the book a little bit too about the ufc really built up infrastructure around vegas in terms of you know the apex where they can broadcast live anytime they want you know there was talk i think this may have stalled out at this point but there was talk of um, the UFC building its own hotel attached to the Apex so they could fly in fighters um, into Vegas and broadcast live. So, you know, I kind of I threw a line in where it, like if the whole world melted down, they like the UFC still has the broadcasting and production infrastructure, thanks to COVID, um, to keep on going week in, week out, whether yeah. there's nuclear war or you I was know, gonna say there, there pandemic, might not be an audience, but they can still be outbreak. You know, yeah, yeah the, the show must go on. <laughs> um, so so real, we didn't we haven't we kind of touched on this with the fighter contracts. Um, you mentioned Rob Macy in your book. Um, Rob Macy is sure enough, an attorney here in Phoenix. Um, 
Uh, he also, I didn't know this until I looked him up, but he also went to my dad and my alma mater, Whitman College, which I was kind of proud to see that. Um, do, you know, I, I look at Arizona as kind of this really interesting state, you know, from a political perspective, because you have like people like Rob Macy out there advocating on behalf of these fighters. But then secondly, obviously, this is where, you know, the Ollie Act came out of uh, from, you know, former Senator John McCain. So I look at Arizona as kind of this interesting place where there's advocacy. There is a legal precedence that's rose up out of here. And yet at the same time, these uh, these MMA fighters do not have the protection of boxers. no. Um, there's some debate about just how effective the Ollie Act is to it. Sort of, um, I think it would be better for UFC fighters if the Ollie Act extended to mixed martial arts and protected them too. But there are a lot of people in the boxing world that are, you know, pretty skeptical of what the Ollie there, Act is. Because there's no regulation of it, assumably? And there's no enforcement. Yeah. I think is the biggest concern. There's all these sort of stipulations um, in the text of the law, but um, there's there's very little enforcement. Um, there's not none. So like there there have been a, a handful of, of famous lawsuits that have come out of it where fighters, mostly like famous rich fighters, already have tried to stand up to their promoters and sue for for violations. Um, but it's tough to do. It's time consuming. You need money in the first place and. You know, it's it's like any other legal issue. Like, you know, you can have you could write a thousand laws that say it's illegal to chew bubble, bubble gum. But if no one's going to arrest you for it or run you through court for it, it doesn't matter what's on the books or what isn't. You know, like jaywalking in New York, you know, it's technically it's illegal, but, you know, no one's going to enforce that. It's, yeah. it's an unenforceable law. So I think. That's been something that has benefited the UFC tremendously, and it's benefited Dana White. I mean, one of the interesting things that um, kind of came up again and again is is how often Dana would go to directly to fighters during contract negotiations and would cut out their representatives or managers or agents and just go directly to them. You know, Randy Couture wrote about this in his memoir where Dana would say, hey, your agents are real jerks. I don't like dealing with them. I can give you a better deal if we just, you know, work together with me. Um, you know, and, and Couture suggested at one point he considered filing a tortious interference suit against the UFC and Dana White for trying to undermine his relationship with his representatives. And that's something that, has been a repeated issue. No one's actually done it, but you know, there may be something questionable about the behavior. It's sort of, you know, it's an open question. I think Rhonda Rousey in her memoir, she spoke about um, negotiating to be a head coach on the ultimate fighter um, very early on in her UFC tenure. And her manager at the time had asked the UFC, according to her, for something like, I think it was $20,000 per episode or something. It would have been the equivalent of like $250,000 for the full season uh, for being the celebrity host of the reality show, um, which, you know, as far as TV contracts go, that seems like a reasonable sum of money for a, yeah. you know a global celebrity to be the one of the main figures. Um, but Rousey says Dana called her directly, didn't call her manager back, but called her directly and said, threatened her to kick her off the show. Say, and if that was the kind of money she was going to ask for. And so she was so afraid of losing her place in the UFC at that point in her career, you know, she hadn't completely established herself yet that she wound up taking whatever the UFC's baseline offer was, which I think at the time was something like $800 or $1,000 per episode. It was a very basic honorarium, um, which also included an apartment to stay in and, sure. and you know, living expenses during filming. Um, but it was a huge difference. And then Rousey wound up dropping the representative uh, a few weeks later, not a few weeks, I've, a few months later, let's say. But, you know, these are and this this is stuff that's ongoing. I think that like the UFC has a history of extremely contentious negotiations 
Um, and, you know, there may be points where not everything that they've done has been, you know, on the up and up. And, sure. But, you know, if there's no if there's no body there to enforce it and if, if fighters themselves, the risk of trying to challenge that kind of behavior could mean losing your entire career as a, a top tier mixed martial artist. And you have to go back to the regionals or a much smaller promotion to finish off your career and you get blacklisted in the biggest um, promotion in the world. You know, it it may actually be the best thing for your career to do is just take the terms you're given and hope that eventually, you know, you can reach Conor McGregor status or deliver enough viral knockouts that, you know, you could make up the difference. Well, and, and uh, yeah, the other thing too, I thought of that uh, on that subject was it kind of reminded me, like if you were in baseball, you were an owned asset for a very long time. Free agency was not such a thing. And it's almost like if you, after I got done with your book, I thought, wow, UFC has to have like a free agency moment. And, and you actually have to have all the fighters all at once say no. And, but that's a very tough thing because the incentives, like we talked about, some of these people are making no money. Uh, just to make $10,000 per fight is a huge uptick from where they're at. Therefore, the incentives don't align to cause them to want to do that. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's I abandoned. I was originally going to do a story about how the, the UFC or mixed martial arts fighters could organize kind of similar to what happened with baseball in the 60s and 70s. You know, it, it's kind of written out of the history a little bit, but. Um, you know, people point to Kurt Flood and the Supreme Court case and the strikes yeah. and everything. But a big part of what made that strike possible, because you had a lot of the same issues um, at play in Major League Baseball, where a lot of the players, they were already making 50, 60, 100 thousand dollars a year. And they didn't want to risk that for, you know, the chance to become millionaires. They were like. You know, they were just playing a game and they thought they they had already lucked out getting a full time salary for something as frivolous as being a, a sports player. So they didn't want to rock the boat. But the one thing that made it possible to get so much buy in for some of the big strikes that happened in the 70s was Marvin Miller was able to negotiate a separate revenue stream for the Players Association through baseball trading card. Yep deals and that funded those strikes so that it mitigated the risk that a lot of the more skeptical players faced and i think you know if mixed martial arts fighters are going to have anything resembling uh you know a similar kind of like um fight with the ufc or bellator or some of the other big promoters in the sport it would really have to start with some kind of entrepreneurial organization where they would create like their own separate revenue stream as a collective independent of the promoters in the same way that those baseball trading card deals were independent of the team owners, independent of the league. You know, they couldn't use the logos for the teams, but they could use their own faces as players. So and in a lot of there's a lot of tools available right now with streaming, you know, Jake Paul's rise as a, a YouTube celebrity and the number of big UFC stars that have YouTube presences, they have Twitch streaming channels. You well, know, those are effectively of, today's trading cards, though. Those are the personalities you get to stare at. Yeah, so you could you could do something collectively as an MMA, you know, fighters group, or you know, however you wanted to brand it. Just you know, have and it wouldn't be enough to give everyone a full time salary, but it could be enough to start, you know providing some some uh, benefits to retired players to maybe build up a strike fund to maybe do their own care costs covered yeah and if you could almost do your own sponsorship deals too like you know if nike doesn't want to sponsor the ufc because it's too questionable or whatever but maybe they could go do a sponsorship deal with john way lee and you know she can't wear it at ufc events but she could wear it on a youtube channel or a twitch stream sure or you know some of these famous fights that we never got to see happen like tony ferguson and khabib Nurmagomedov, or george st pierre and anderson silva well, you know, maybe you could do a, a sort of light fantasy spar and put it on YouTube and get 10 million views of like 
George St. Pierre sparring three rounds with Anderson Silva and headgear and boxing gloves, you know, it's not the same as a real fight, but in terms of just creating a, like a supplemental revenue stream and something that wouldn't be completely dependent on the UFC as a platform for, you know, anything a fighter could do to make money for themselves. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Agree. And, and to follow on your craps analogy, you don't make money on the craps table playing the pass line. You make money behind the pass line, ultimately. And that's the difference between being a, a you know, a thousand, a hundred thousand air and being a millionaire in this sport is taking the risks to make really the big money on the table. Um, so completely agree w- with you on your baseball, uh, discussion there too. Um, there's a lot of things we didn't talk about, uh, I'm looking through my notes. I mean, this is such a fun book, Michael. I, I love this book. I like, I, you know, this is our first sports book we've ever done. And I, I was kind of hesitant to do it because I thought, oh, I'm a guy. It's going to be so stereotypical. But the business side of this, the stories of the fighters, the passion you have for the sport just leaked out over and over again. The backstories of like Chris Albrecht at HBO and what scuttled their deal then and you know, how the Fertitas looked at this like discovery channel, um, for the business and all, all this stuff that, you know, like I said earlier, the demographics you talk about, I, of all the things we talked about, is there anything else that we, we haven't discussed that you do think needs to be mentioned for this book? I mean, the, the healthcare thing, long-term healthcare thing, retirement benefits, I think is an ongoing issue that I think everyone should focus on it even more important than the sort of vanities of Ari Emanuel as a business person and you know the rise and fall of the UFC's like licensing deals and sponsorship deals and all that kind of stuff and the armchair quarterbacking I think there's still a very active live issue and problem with how mixed martial arts fighters are treated after their careers are done in terms of access to health care, retirement benefits. Um, you know, Stefan Bonner just passed away. Um, you know, he was pivotal in the UFC's history. He was, he was one of the, one of the original finalists on the ultimate fighter that helped turn the company around. You know, he had a long, um, struggle with substance abuse in his post fight career. He took a lot of trauma during his, um, days in the UFC and uh, you know he seemed to struggle especially in his final years without access to um, health care treatment for substance abuse and all kinds of other you know chronic pain symptoms that sort of help push him deeper into these substance abuse um, patterns and you know I think there's a lot of people like that who are less famous um, but that still wind up suffering. Um, and that, that to me, I think if, if there's an ongoing kind of storyline that could come out of the book would be a continued kind of focus on that and a continued pressure on the UFC to treat, you know, not just its celebrity fighters, but all of its fighters better after retirement in terms of health care and at least some kind of financial benefit. I think that's the most important thing. That's one of the things I'd like to focus on myself. Yeah. And I, I agree with you. I think the, that human aspect, like, um, you know, we can look at the success, but what goes on on average under the surface to the fighters that we don't see, I think there's a real humanitarian issue uh, that you do a good job of describing. Um, I think of like, I think of like, you know, during talking about the ultimate fighter in Lebanon and what he had gone through in his past life. And, and if you look forward, like I Wikipedia Lebanon just to kind of see, you know, where did he end up? How did that all go? It's just like, it's a tragedy. Yeah, it's a tragedy. It's a super tragedy. So, um, Michael, I love this book. I love their story. I agree with you. I would, I, if I were you, I would send this to like every U.S. House of Rep seat and senator and just say, hey, call me. Read this and call me because I think it's, there's, there's a great story to be said, uh, not only giving you know, more regulation, but really something with teeth. Um, like you said, the Ali Act doesn't have teeth. Um, it does it make certain things illegal, but you know, what's not reported doesn't ever go known. So, um, I really appreciate you joining me for this podcast today. 
Um, if you'd like to read a book about incentives, like we're talking about now with these fighters and their lives, both good and bad, Cage Kings will teach you all about human behavior and biases and the things we're going to fall back to uh, ultimately in our lives based on how things uh, you know, end up playing out. The story will also teach you about the content and content distribution business as well, as we talked about Semaphore and pay-per-view and cable channels, um, as well as, as, as talking with these fighters and, and how we go about uh, you know, going through these business discussions, the contract law of business. Um, if you enjoyed this podcast, go to Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you, you listen to a book with legs, give us a review, tell others about the books and authors like Michael that we have on to understand this world that we live in. For our tribe, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, email podcast at smeadcap.com. That's podcast at smeadcap.com. You can also send suggestions to our Twitter handle, uh, which is at smeadcap. Thank you for joining us for a Book With Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.